Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here in Delhi University after five years. Five long years, I must say. India recently celebrated its 65th Republic Day on 26 January. There's an interesting event which happens three days later called the Beating Retreat. Now, the Beating Retreat itself takes inspiration from the custom of beating drums at the end of the day of hostilities when the forces come back to the garrison to fight another day. The beating retreat this time for me individually reflected the national mood. You know, from the start of this century, uh, global media, heads of state, economists, Wall Street has been predicting that India will be the next big thing. But in the last couple of years, the recessionary growth rates have made many, including me, question whether India has lost its plot, whether we have made fatal mistakes in our growth strategy. The question for me as an Indian is, standing here today, that will India come out of the shadows and fight tomorrow? And if she does, will she win the war? Well, uh, I'm quarter of a century old today. I like saying that because it makes me feel relatively mature in a heavyweight audience. Anyway, uh, I belong to the state of Bihar and in the last 25 years, my home state has gone from being a lawless, economically backward part of the country to becoming probably the most underdog star of Indian economics. Well, yes, a lot has changed. Yes, uh, things have improved. And this is how. In my lifetime, and I think the average age of the audience would be roughly 20, the per capita income of India has gone up by 4.5 times and the GDP itself has gone up by seven times in my lifetime alone. This is reflective in the national mood. We became confident, more sure-footed, whether you see the movies, music, national security, sports, in all spheres of our national politics and social society, we became a more confident nation. But yet, and this is, by the way, uh, this is the total value of all the companies listed on the Bombay Stock Exchange since my birth, 1988 till 2013. Anyway. Still, despite such amazing growth in the last 25 years, there's still a discontentment in the youth of today. Now, moving on. The picture in the background out there is of Nathula Pass in Sikkim. It's roughly 14,000 feet above the sea level, and it was sealed off after the 1962 war with China, which we lost. Well, now that India and China are friendly neighbors, the pass was opened uh, six, uh, eight years back. And in those eight years, the annual trade deficit between India and China has gone up from $4 billion per annum to $31 billion in the last eight years alone. Hence, uh, there are many who believe in welfare economics and spoon feeding and things like that. When they tell me that, be happy, why are you cribbing about bad infrastructure or excessive subsidies, etc.? My answer to them often is, are you kidding me? Let me explain how. When I was born in 1988, an average Chinese if an average Chinese made $100, an average Indian made $129 or $130, call it. Today, by the time the future leaders of India went to kindergarten, then high school, jumped 21 cutoffs to land in Delhi University, India is a very different place. Today, for, if an average Chinese earns $100, an average Indian only makes 25 But more importantly, what is important to notice here is the second chart, the second graph out there, that if an average Indian, if an average Chinese invests $100 today in capital formation, an average Indian only invests $18. Now that is important. That is important because capital formation results in higher income and higher income eventually contributes to capital formation. It's the most important chicken and egg situation in, 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 in Indian economics today. Now, if you lose to a gold medalist in Olympics by a couple of seconds, you might call it a good fight and you know, go out for a drink and call it a good fight. But this looks more like the scorecard of an India-Brazil football match. Let's get real, we got slammed here. And there's no other way to look at it. Well, but the economists and experts differ. Economists are a funny crowd. They're a bit like weather forecasters across the world. They have extreme predictions and every prediction is based on 200 caveats. Taking the risk of oversimplification, I took the average of a PwC estimate and a Citibank estimate for 2050 GDP 
in PPP terms for India. The number comes out to be roughly $60 trillion. What that translates into, and this is important, is that Indians and India might be sitting on the biggest value creation in human history. And that is like being in the US in late 1800s or being in the UK during the Industrial Revolution. This, we, we are sitting on a gold mine here. But many predictions in history have failed. Many smart people have made many stupid predictions. This is a classic example. Time magazine in 1996 said that remote shopping, which is basically e-commerce, will flop because women like to get out of the house, like to handle merchandise, and like to change their minds. Well, today it's a trillion dollar market. This is my favorite. Decca Records, which was a legendary record uh, back then, it, it featured Rolling Stones, by the way, uh, said no to Beatles, saying that they don't, don't have a future in show business. Uh, the, the executive from Decca Records actually went ahead and said that four-piece groups with guitars don't have a future, they're dead. Well, today Decca Records have faded away, while Beatles have sold 2.3 billion albums till date. Well, the point here is, ladies and gentlemen, that predictions often fail because of miscalculation, bad judgment, or bad execution. Which ironically brings me to the topic of the day, which is that I don't think the experts are wrong this time. I think, and I unquestionably think, that India has won a lottery. We are sitting on a gold mine. The only problem is, we seem to have forgotten the ticket. And my talk today is about how to find the ticket back and win the lottery, hopefully. Well, if you notice here, the, uh, the drop in capital formation typically precedes the drop in income. So, because we have limited time here, if you have to come to a big picture solution to the problem India faces, the answer is simple. Get more capital. And once you get more capital, invest it more efficiently. And that should solve the problem we are in today. But, like all predictions, this one has a rider too. And it's a big one. Well, uh, one of the gentlemen at the Hoover Institute uh, once remarked that the first lesson in politics is to forget the first lesson in economics. That is especially true for India today. Now, uh, there's a reason why I have the Jaguar E-Type out there. Elon Musk, who is the founder of the largest um, electric car company in the world, Tesla, uh, once asked as to what is his favorite car in the world in history. His answer was the Jaguar E-Type. And once he, for the first time, he got enough money to buy one, he went ahead and bought a 1961 Jag E-Type. But in one of his interviews, he remarked to the car as a bad girlfriend because it kept breaking down on him every now and then. In my view, and it's a slightly, you know, it's a long drawn conclusion, that Indian electorate also often behaves in a similar manner because it keeps breaking down on you every now and then, it throws tantrums. but every once in a while, it reminds you that it's the stuff of legends. It, its sheer adaptability amazes me. Now, to those who have been following politics in India in the last couple of years, you would have noticed that the tone of political language has changed much more towards growth-oriented politics. Well, the political leaders, as well as the electorate, need to raise the level of the debate. We have played enough with the margin of error in the last half a decade, and I think it's a time to stop, and I think we will. In my view, and we are still a couple of months away from elections, in my view, India will give a decisive verdict in this election and in the next few elections to come in favor of high growth-focused politics in the next few years. And if that does not happen, ladies and gentlemen, then we'll go ahead and see a lot of Amitabh Bachchan angry young man movies in the next few decades. Anyway, moving on, let's assume for a moment that Indian electorate gets it right and we live in a democratic utopia. India still needs a hell lot of capital to grow. It still needs capital to provide for basics. Well, if you take out the IPO market, which is the initial public offering market, there are three broad buckets of capital available today. One is private equity. It believes in the big deal sizes. It believes in funding companies which are mid to large size. Think airports, infrastructure, think telecom companies, think pharmaceutical companies, those kind of things. Venture capital, like uh, many of you might know, funds exponentially high growth companies. Think Facebook in its initial years. Think Flipkart, think Just Dial, Snapdeal, etc. 
those are the kind of template venture capital works on and well some of your students here if you are starting out in a garage and you don't have any money you give a call to the angel investors and they are the ones who put seed stage capital so that you can come out of the basement hopefully someday anyway together these three categories invested roughly 8 to 9 billion dollars last year in india and most of it went to create value most of it went to create value things like cheap telecom calls things like mind boggling e-commerce growth airports how do you think all these things come they come because there are people putting in capital in the country it does not happen automatically and there is a there is a small problem with that which is that most of the for profit capital in india and across the world goes towards the viable the very very viable market which is that what happens because of the dna of the for profit capital is that the bottom 50% of the population gets ignored and that is where i want to introduce you to the you know various idiosyncrasies idiosyncrasies of indian politics and indian economics now look at this delhi versus bihar example an average person in bihar today earns roughly eight times that of an average person in delhi now what's noticing is that roughly 85% of the bihar is not fed by electricity grid while roughly 100% in delhi is connected to the grid so majority of the population in bihar today still uses hurricane lamps for basic lighting while in delhi we are moving to cfls like these years typically 30 watt cfls we use for lighting purposes for reading purposes and hence an average person in bihar has to pay three times the price that of an average person in delhi just for basic 4 hours of lighting per annum now just keep in mind this is without uh, this is with the government subsidies if you take out the government subsidies which effectively come out of taxpayer money an average person in bihar who makes 8 times less money than an average person in delhi pays 11 times the price for basic lighting and this is so that her children or her kids can compete with the kids in delhi in a new resurgent india of tomorrow i mean this kind of inequality is criminal it's absurd and you have to think about those people making 17000 bucks an annum as consumers they are not economic refugees and which brings me to the point of impact investment those people will be served only by funds who believe in more than just an economic return well i work i am the co-founder uh, for delhi plus acumen it's a volunteer run chapter for acumen fund acumen itself is a non-profit venture fund and believes in business models which are viable but target poverty let me give you an example it funded something called the husk power systems in bihar in west champaran typically and uh, those guys what they do is that they take rice husk and basic agricultural waste convert it into electricity and sell it to the grid very simple idea but it has a huge outstanding impact today it's helping 1.5 to 2 lakh people in bihar earn a livelihood and it's giving them electricity it's feeding electricity to the grid well to me folks working at uh, places like haspa systems in west champaran are the real heroes of india's economic engine i don't have a lot of time so uh moving ahead another remarkable company is zikitsa healthcare it's an acumen portfolio company again it provides basic ambulance it's provides sorry full fledged ambulance services at a basic cost structure in mumbai and other parts of the country now cutting the long story short what zikitsa does is that if you're going to government hospital it will charge you a subsidized fare and if you're going to a private sector hospital it will charge you the full fare now this is a world class institution it got founded in 2002 became a social enterprise in 2005 launched a service called 1298 in something around 2005 and got funded by acumen in 2007 perhaps the best demonstration of their effectiveness is the fact that when the 2611 attacks happened in bombay they were the first ones on scene they were there before police came and that proves the fact that viable for profit business models in the social space can work and they can compete with the best in the world well we need a lot of zikitsas in india today and we need a lot of acumens in india today we have some people like omedia network lok capital etc but we need a lot of them obviously if the political climate does not change nothing will come neither for profit nor impact investing but in my view if the government 
wants such kind of more ventures, it needs to roll out a red carpet. It needs to realize that making money in impact you know, industries, high impact industries like affordable healthcare, energy, education is not a crime. People who are paying for subsidy, uh, you know, services like these can often be better served by a viable for-profit model than subsidies. And this is the only shot that a lot of us, a lot of us probably not present in the room will get at touching their dreams. The bottom of India still does not live in conference rooms like these. And which brings me to the last slide, which is that, you know, India is a country of hopes and dreams and we are a young nation, we are a young republic, both in terms of the age of the republic and the age of an average Indian. In 1967, uh, the Films Division of India produced a film called I Am 20, which documented the lives of people who were 20 year olds in 1967. That is, they were born around 15th of August, 1947. What is surprising is, that their language, their, their attire, their convictions might be different, but the basic psyche, the basic fabric of the psyche is very same compared to the 20 year olds in this room today. And I'd like to show a short clip of it, it's a 30 second clip anyway. Hindustan ka bhavishya to vaisa aaj mein kaise bata sakungi? I don't think there's any future left for us. We have got only a big past to boast of. As Kennedy put it, I think it's a question of not what the country can do for you as much as what you can do for the country. Of course, frustration is in fashion today. But I think deep within every Indian, despite all this frustration, we are underestimating him. He has a capacity to work 